talked about humus, and now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. We're going to look at the little creatures uh, that really make the difference uh, in, and how we can work with them rather than against them uh, to build our profitability. So we're going to look at the key creatures, bacteria, fungi, algae, um, protozoa, nematodes and earthworms. And of course, as we said, the big mindset thing here is that we've sort of, many of us have used the soil as something to stand a plant up in. And the big chain, paradigm is the set of beliefs that you've picked up from your life's experience, from your family perhaps, from your education, from your neighbours, whatever. And this is your little narrow vision, this is how the world works. Well, that mindset, the biggest mindset change here is to realise that, that you're living, dealing with this huge subterranean invisible workforce and everything you do impacts it either positively or negatively and it's going to be a hell of a lot better for you if you can make that negative uh, positive rather than negative. You look after it, you look after the system and it looks after you. It's a very simple, different way of thinking for many people initially. So we'll talk about each of these creatures separately. We'll start off with bacteria, as I said, uh, tiny creatures, 500,000 on a pinhead, uh, and a, a good soil has a billion of them in just a teaspoon. Good compost is five billion per teaspoon. Um, and that kind of beneath ground, that subterranean livestock, can often outweigh your above ground, depending on what kind of stocking rates you've got. But you've got five cows per hectare, uh, two and a half tonnes per hectare in a good soil. You can even get as high uh, in some soils. Those Amazon terapeutic soils actually had 10 cows per hectare, or have 10 cows per hectare, but five cows is a good soil. Now, you can also get bacteria that don't need oxygen. They're called anaerobic bacteria, and they like compacted soils. And this is pretty much what we're seeing here. This bloke's worked it wet, and my goodness, it's a horrible mess. But as he, walked, as he worked this, there would have been times where he got really unpleasant smells that oozed from that soil. And one of those smells is called hydrogen sulfide, which smells like rotten eggs. And the other one's called butyric acid, which smells very close to vomit. Uh, and the problem with those two substances that are produced by anaerobic bacteria is that they're toxic to plants. So not a good story uh, for your next crop in those soils with that kind of uh, anaerobic activity happening. These organisms that do well in these tight closed soils because they don't need oxygen. You can also have um, bugs that or bacteria that survive with or without oxygen uh, and they're called facultative anaerobes. And the problem with this, particularly if we're talking about brewing up bugs, because you don't want any of these, um, these facultatives in there because one of them's called E. coli and another one's called Enterococcus. And Enterococcus is, is actually hospital-inquired infections and they can live with oxygen, which is your compost tea, and breed up with that or without oxygen. So they're called facultative anaerobes, but it's really one of the reasons you have to be real careful with your hygiene when you're making compost teas because you can brew up the bad guys if you do it wrong. And we'll talk about how to do it right shortly. There's also a bacteria that's um, a bit unusual, it's sort of like a fungi because it produces little hyphae but it is actually part of the bacteria family, it's called Actinomycetes. It doesn't make a bad smell, it's the guy that makes the delicious smell of fresh healthy soil. Uh, and interestingly, when we start evaluating soil life and evaluating soil health, that little thing called a nose on the front of your face is as valuable as a $500,000 piece of equipment because you won't see many exceptions your best block, if you, t if you take a handful of soil and smell it, your best block uh, is going to smell a lot nicer uh, than your worst block. And what you're smelling is the actinomycetes and their numbers, but they're signpost creatures. If they're there and you can smell them, the stronger the better, uh, basically everything else is present. Uh, and so it's a really good, simple indication of where you're at. And the worse your soil and the more problems, the less smell and to a point where it really even can get a bit sour. Uh, so no smell, no life, more chemicals and less profit is the simple equation there. So bacteria, uh, when you've got two and a half tonne of them in your soil, of course they are reducing leaching, they are retaining nutrients in their body, they are actually capable of removing most toxins from the soil and one of the great benefits from this thing called compost tea is that you, know, you can take a, say you've got, you've got a soil that you've had a soil life test on and you've knocked the hell out of your organisms with your practices over the years and you say, okay, I'm going to bring them back. Well, you can put a compost in there, and while there's many good things that compost does, one of the good things is the fact that it contains this mass of five billion organisms per teaspoon. And you can see this big increase when you put out a few tons of compost, but then you can come back sometimes six weeks, six weeks later, uh, and you'll see back to where you, back to where you started, because you didn't actually change um, the root cause of why you never had any, which is often chemical residues that have built up in your soil and go on to kill 
the next guys you bring in. Now, the big thing about compost tea, and there are many good things about it, it's so cheap, it's you know, a couple of dollars a hectare is all you need to spend on it. Um, but you brought out this huge 100 litres per hectare, a massive new army of organisms. I mean, you can do it with less than that. That's the amount I like. But um, army of organisms, and you might knock off with your chemical residues 95% uh, of them within three weeks. It's quite conceivable when I've seen it happen. Uh, but you've got 5% still out there doing the work and, and like an advance party preparing the way. Because it's so cheap, you've got a centre pivot and you've got a tank set up, there's nothing to just saying, oh, I'll chuck in another brew. Uh, and you do that 10 days later. Uh, and because you can, it's so cheap and you're set up now to do it. And this time, another 5%. Now yeah, you've got 10% clearing the way. Uh, and it's the first time ever there's been a technology where in a single season, uh, we've got carrot growers, 20,000 acre carrot growers in the US uh, who'll do it every week. Well, why not? It costs nothing. Uh, and, and in a single year, they're back in the game. They've actually cleaned up the rubbish because the only things capable of cleaning up rubbish, the bacteria can clean up every known substance except cadmium. You can't, they can't work on cadmium. Cadmium stays there for a thousand years, so you don't want to build up too much of it. But everything else, and the, and the ironical thing is, here's this creature that can take everything out, but we crossed the line and killed it, so I can't take everything out. And so a compost tea gives you a chance to get back in the game in a short time, very inexpensively. And that's probably the biggest benefit of compost tea. So, what else do bacteria do other than cleaning your soil and reducing leaching? They produce a sticky substance, a biofilm, that, that they actually produce so that it gives them a bit of a hiding place and whole communities will live like a boy in a bubble of this little glob of slimy, sticky stuff. Um, and that enables them to escape particularly protozoa. We'll talk about protozoa shortly. A protozoa eats 10,000 bacteria every day. That's its main role in the soil. And we'll talk about why it does that and how that works in a moment. But So you develop systems that will uh, protect you from being constantly gobbled up. And one of them is to make this, but it serves a dual purpose. These, this um, sticky biofilm works just like, in fact, exactly like water crystals. And you know what water crystals do, and maybe you don't, but water crystals are used in the nursery industry and in some intensive horticulture. Uh, to hold moisture, really dramatically hold moisture in the root zone. So we have growers who will ring, have done a course, uh, intensive horticulture guys, vegetable growers, and they'll ring up and say, we've only been doing this six months and we're, you know, we're paying uh, big money for water and we're monitoring it with computers and we've got whole systems of water monitoring and we're down 40% in our water requirements. How do you explain this? Well, you can't really explain it on... Um, on the amount of humus you've built in six months, because it would never account for 40% in six months. And so I always get the consultants to ask the question, uh, you know, tell me about your practices. And what you find is that there are people who are bought into this brewing concept and they're doing it regularly. And what they're doing is creating this water retention through the water crystals from that billions, trillion, I mean, you do the sums with 100 litres, 5 billion in a teaspoon. So how many teaspoons in a, in a hundred litres? I can't even work that out quickly, but it's a lot. Uh, and it's trillions upon trillions, trillions of trillions of this workforce that has, has gives you this great opportunity to, to, to build this water crystal effect around the root zone. So these kind of tricks that are inexpensive and very effective and well, well and truly proven are tremendously valuable in a world where water is becoming more and more scarce and more and more precious.